Welcome everyone, my name is Steve Carter and how awesome would it be to have a first name as L.A.? I mean, I'm just Steve, like, but when you have a name like L.A., that's just instant credibility, instant credibility. Hey, this is my second time to Faith Bridge. I'm, I'm just, I, I love this church. I love Pastor Ken. Uh, he, he reached out a few months ago and said, hey, would you like to come back out to Faith Bridge? And I was like, sure, I would love it. I would love it. He's like, great, we're going to be in the series. I'm like, awesome. Uh, the series is like about deadly sins, the seven deadly sins. I'm like, okay, fantastic, great, great. And then he went, he went a little dark. He went a little silent on me. And then I got an email. He's like, hey, where I'm thinking is that you're going to talk on lust. And I was like, and I'm thinking you're crazy. But uh, truth be told, uh, I, I'm actually really, really honored. And I know you all don't know me, whether you're watching online or in the communion room or here in this room. I know we don't really know each other very well. And here's what I need you to understand. My job right now is not to try and shock you. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. My job is not just to shame you. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. My hope, though, is that you'll go on a journey with me about what it means to be human. What it means to actually be human. So, you know, as we go through this whole kind of series on seven deadly sins, you got to understand that the idea of sin is actually quite powerful. Uh, really, the original language means to live less than. Whenever we sin, whenever we make a decision or a choice or a you know, some word comes out of our mouth or, or we do something in a way that we choose to live less than what we were intended when God created us. That's what sin is. The crazy part, though, is when we sin against another. And what are we doing? We're helping them become less than and lesser than what God intended them to be. And each one of these seven deadly sins actually is rooted in something good. As C.S. Lewis, the great writer, says that all evil is is good that has been co-opted. Good that has been co-opted. So when you're talking about money, when you're talking about power, when you're talking about sex, when you're talking about just all of these opportunities that has started out that God created but somehow they can get twisted and co-opted by culture and broken people like you and me. And so today, I want to teach us and remind us what the scriptures showcase for us to be true Talmudim, true disciples, people who are fully human. To do that, I want to take you back to an old writer. His name is Blaise Pascal, and he had this, this great quote. It actually became like a book, and he just says, man is neither angel nor beast. I love that. And, and what Blaise Pascal recognizes is that there's a difference between animals and angels. There is a wild difference between beasts and animals. And, and here's what I mean. I, I used to live in Southern California, and one day, uh, I, get a, I get a phone call from my wife, and she says, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. There is the cutest kitten that is living outside our house. And right away, I was like, no, we're not taking a cat in. It's not happening. No, you don't understand. He had crawled up and climbed up to a tree, and he was just sticking his head out, looking at us. He's adorable. I'm like, I do not care. All dogs go to heaven, not cats. And so like, I, I'm, I'm sitting there just like, I've seen the movie, you know? And so I'm just like, I'm like, this isn't, this isn't right. And she's like, Steve, I'm telling you, like, he's out in the cold. I'm like, we live in Southern California. He's not cold. <laughs> but then I came and I saw this cat and it just walked up and it started to purr, started to like go around, like figure eights through my legs. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I love you. And, um, <laughs> and so we just started putting on a little milk, little, little food. And then um, I remember, it was a couple years ago, it's, it's a Good Friday service, and I, I'm getting ready. I got this message on the cross. I'm so fired up. And all of a sudden, my wife calls again. She's like, you're not going to believe this. I, 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 I had seen that we had named her Pony, the cat. Um, we, I had seen that Pony was 
putting on a little weight, but I just thought it was because I was giving her some milk. <laughs> but on Good Friday, my wife calls and goes, you're not gonna believe this. And I was like, what? Pony. I'm like, yeah, what, she okay? Yeah, she's okay, but so are nine other ones. I'm like, <laughs> what? I was like, I told you we weren't supposed to take this cat in. And now we've got 10 cats. <laughs> and so I'm just like thinking about this. I go through Good Friday, they come back, and then I just see all these little kittens. And so we, we, you know, we get someone out. We start creating our own like adoption agency and like kind of just funneling these cats to some nice human being. And I kid you not, four months later, Pony gets pregnant again. <laughs> and so this is what literally happens. What literally happens. I end up taking Pony for a little walk. And I get down on my knee and I just say, hey, hey, hey I, I don't know if anybody's ever had a conversation with you, little cat. <laughs> but I just need you to know something. You are a respectable woman. <laughs> Unless he puts a ring on it. <laughs> Make him... Make him love you. Don't keep doing this. It's not the right cycle. You're better than this. Now, I say this, but there's, a cat goes into heat. It's not having like existential questions like, should I, is he the one? Should I, it just happens. And I think when you think about animals, what Blaise Pascal is actually talking about is desire. And I want you to understand that desire is something so, so profound. But underneath the idea of what it means to be an animal, which we are not, is the question of desire. Can we control our desires or do our desires control us? Now, if you even think about this, you go out to Las Vegas, and all of a sudden, what do you hear? You hear animalistic language. Look at her, she's a cougar. We've just like started to name people. I, I'm going, like I'm gonna, whatever happens in that city, you know, I'm just gonna be a party animal. And what are they basically saying? You can lose all control and allow your desires to take over. And friends, this is the life of David in many ways. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we learn that David was supposed to go off to war like all the other kings, but he stays home. And something happens when he stays home is he walks out on his roof, and you got to understand, um, the way that I was taught this story as a kid is so wildly different from when you actually study this, this passage. See, I was taught that this was all Bathsheba's fault. And I think we actually did a lot of damage to some women. But I want to tell you this. David has all of the power. He is the king and he ought to be at war. But something happens when he gets out on his roof and he's looking at his kingdom and he's seeing everything that he owns, everything that's under his control. And then he's like, oh, okay, I see you. And there's this woman on a roof and she's bathing. And so what happens? David has a desire. But what happens is this animalistic tendency comes over. And so what does he do? I deserve that. I deserve that. So he calls his servant over and goes, hey, 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 who's she? I don't know. I'll go find out. It's Bathsheba. Oh, really? She's married. Oh, it's okay. Um, bring her to me. And this is literally what happens. When we find ourselves in animalistic patterns is we move in these movements of desire, deserve, and then demand. Now, I just want you to know, many of us in this room struggle with this, truly. You ever have this moment like where you're like, man, you just have these desires, maybe it's to purchase something, maybe it's just to experience something, maybe it's to eat something, maybe it's to, to, to be with your spouse or somebody else, and all of a sudden you're like, I've been so good for six, six days. I deserve this. I deserve to buy this. I deserve to eat this. I deserve to partake in this. And then what ends up happening is many of us find ourselves thinking we deserve it. And it doesn't matter the consequences. 
we just start to demand it and push it forward. And this is at the heart of the Me Too movement. In many, many ways, what we've begun to see is how it has become easy for our desires to become animalistic and for people to say, I deserve this because of my power, and now I demand it. Does this make sense? But I want to tell you, I want to tell you that sometimes, and I know we live in a very heightened sexual animalistic culture, but there's another way that's equally dangerous, and that is that of angels. Angels. No, you're like, wait, 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 wait. Angels are spiritual animals. I mean, they're like, no, what do you mean? Here's the thing. When we think about angels and you flip through the book and the scriptures and you begin to see like Hebrews, and you, you, re you realize that they are spiritual beings, but there's no physical body to them. And I remember talking with my mentor and we were just discussing the difference between angels and animals. And he was like, you know, it's so fascinating. And, and this mentor was telling me that his friend had interviewed... Hugh Hefner. Now, if you don't know who Hugh Hefner is, ask your mom. Now, here's, here's, here's what I need you to know. Hugh Hefner, when he was interviewed, grew up in a house where he was never hugged. He was never told that he was loved. And what was happening in that home? Subversively, subconsciously, it was this. Deny Deny, deny. Deny that you have any feelings. And I think for many of us, maybe you grew up in a home almost having these desires, but this is what you've, you found yourself doing is pretending I shouldn't have them. I shouldn't have them. Desires are bad. And what we found ourselves doing is almost stuffing all of that down underneath the surface. But here's what I need you to understand. You are not animals and you're not angels, but you all have desire. The question becomes is how do we really do this? See, I grew up in a house where I had the talk. And you know what I'm talking about when I say the talk. And you know what the talk was? Don't use cocaine and don't get a girl pregnant. That was my talk. That was it. That was the, this, this as a seventh grade boy playing basketball was the talk. I have literally no map for what I'm seeing in the world and what is coming at me on television and what is walking down the halls. I have no map whatsoever. And you know what I decided to think? Maybe, maybe if I have these thoughts, I'm wrong. And maybe if I have these desires, I'm bad. And maybe if I have these feelings, I'm just broken. And you know what I did? I tried with everything that I could not to be an animal, because I heard terrible messages about how bad they are, that I wanted to be an angel. And I wanted to be good. And I'll, I'll tell you what, to be just fully candid, it was very destructive. Because what I learned was to deny and to detach myself from the desires and actually from this part that God made in me. And so I, I'm just here. If animals are like people who find themselves having desire, which is human, but they, where they go with it is I deserve it and I demand it. Angels are, I have desire and I deny it and I detach from it. Just think about this for a second. What does your home embody? What does your home celebrate? I'm not saying that your home celebrates this, but, but maybe if you have a high school student, maybe if you have a college student, maybe you have a junior high student going through puberty, have you actually ever just began to talk and engage about culture, about lust, about the talk, and if not, and I know it will be awkward, it's like God was like, let's create awkward moments, you know? He, he's like, I, I wanna make that, but, but here's what you have to understand, is if you're not having those conversations, culture is, and culture's either gonna shame them or say, come over here. Let's just, you deserve all your desires to run crazy. And I've just watched this. 
I've watched this in 20 plus years of ministry. I've watched this and when I've seen junior high students. I've watched this in college ministry. I've watched this in large churches across the country. I have seen this as a student to culture, that we are living in this bifurcated reality of angels and animals. And Blaise Pascal was right. We're neither. We're neither. And when we flip through this book, the scriptures, it's really, really clear about what we're called to be. And that is a third way. And that is to be fully human. And what is human? To be human is to recognize that we are both physical and soul and spiritual beings. See, animals, it's all physical. There's no soul and spirit. Angels, it's all soul and spirit, no physical. We, we are both. We are both. And Paul, if you think I'm just like making this up, Paul understood this. And Paul writes so brilliantly in a letter to a church that was in many ways, people would say, just like Vegas. And, and he's writing to these Corinthians. And people would literally, they, they, they had this word in that culture. What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to Corinthian Nice. And they, it, was, it was like this, this harbor town. And people would get on boats, and for the weekend, they'd go into Corinth to do what they came to do, to live as animals. And look what Paul writes to this church. This church is trying to be fully human. He goes this, I have the right to do anything, animal, you say, but not everything is beneficial. Very true. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. That's a powerful line. What he's naming there is the tension. I have these desires, but I'm not gonna allow my desires to control me. Look what it says. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Stop right there. Desire was thought in the ancient world to be in the belly, to be in the gut. And many ancient philosophers thought, you can't control your desires. So just follow your desires. And again, Paul's saying, no, 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 there's a different way. And look what he says. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But, well, back then, if you hooked up, that was like considered marriage. So that's what he's doing. He's like saying, hey, if you're hooking up, like this is like a, this is like a sign of marriage. Look what it says, verse 17. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. And then verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. What's Paul saying here? What was a temple? A temple was where the spirit in the presence of God was. And Paul does something so genius, so powerful, is he merges the desires in the physical with the spiritual when he says, you are a temple. I mean, just think about this. You are a temple. You have the spiritual, the power, the weight. And yet, it's like a physical, actual being. It's both. Now, I never set out to be a preacher. I actually was a film major. My dad went to USC for cinematography, and so I thought I would just kind of follow in that. And I remember, I just study film, study film, study film. And when I was in college, I had some buddies who said, hey, 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 man, we, we, we need um, a junior high uh, teacher for winter camp. And so they invited me to come out, but they, they gave me a test test run. They wanted to test me out, which I was like, okay. I, and I said, hey, what do you want me to teach on? And uh, they said, uh, well, we'd love for you to teach on, just like Pastor Ken, lust. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. 
So I'm like, I can do whatever I want. They're like, yep, as long as it's biblical. I said, fantastic. So this is what I did. I'm not recommending this. I can't even believe people still allow me to teach, but this is what I did. <laughs> I'm a movie guy, and I like the movie Godfather. And there's this scene in Godfather where you, you got this guy who's walking into his bedroom. He looks at his wife and goes, hey, why are the drapes open? And she's like, I didn't open them. And then he looks at her and goes, get down. And then the whole windows just get shot up. Da -da 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 -da. Just shot up. Da -da 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 -da. And then there's this moment, a number of scenes later, where he walks and he has this conversation with the person that he thinks put the hit on him and his family. He goes, in my house? In my house? Where my wife sleeps? In my house. And I remember watching this. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking about like, I wonder if God ever feels that way about us. I wonder if God ever has like this moment where he like looks at my life and, he, and he's like, in my house, in my house, where my spirit sleeps in my house. And so terrible junior high move. I'm like, we're going to watch this movie, <laughs> old VCR. It's like, in my house. And I'm like, and there's like junior high kids crying. I'm like, that's right. You need Jesus. Terrible, terrible, right? But I think about this though for a second. You gotta think about this. You gotta you really just think about it for a second. Like you've got this whole idea where so much of culture is running off and doing whatever they desire because they deserve it and they demand it and it's leading to such profound brokenness, not just in them, but in their families and in our culture. And then you got a whole bunch of people who are like, no, 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 I got these desires and I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid, I don't know what to do with them, so I'm gonna deny them, and I'm gonna detach from my body. And then here's this powerful prophet, rabbi, apostle from the scriptures named Paul saying, hey, 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 can I just tell you? You're a temple. That's what it means to be human, physical, spiritual, not to detach and deny and not to deserve and to demand, but there's another way. And this is, this is what I think he's getting at, is to be human means to have desires, but then to learn how to discuss them and then learn how to delight in them. And this is what I mean. It doesn't, and this, this isn't just a message for guys and this isn't just a message for women. It's just, this is us. This isn't just a message for young people and not for old people. This is a message that God has put desires in us. And again, sin and evil is like when they get co-opted. But for us to be human is, is to be able to have the amazing ability to discuss our desires. And I talk about my desires with my wife all the time. She talks about her desires. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about one active desire, but I'm, I'm talking about like, hey, here's, here are the places where it can be so easy to find ourselves being tempted and tested. Here are the places where I can feel all of this shame where I'm like, don't talk about it, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. You should be better than this. You're a pastor. Like you should, you should have it all together. No, 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 Here's the truth. You're human. You have desires. And every woman I've ever known they're like, I want to be seen in a certain way by the person I cherish and love. And every guy I've ever walked with is, man, I have these desires and I want to be seen and known. And, and they just need a place to discuss them. And this is what scares me for so many junior high kids and high school students and college students is they don't have the people that they can discuss this with. And so it's either shame or a whole bunch of action that leads to shame. And this is where we as the church have to get better at modeling this so that we actually say, yeah, lust is potential. Lust is possible. But I, I don't wanna go there and I don't wanna blow up my marriage and blow up my life and I don't wanna shame myself and not show up fully human for my kids because then I'm just pretending. I wanna be real. And so, this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk in a remaining time about how you, how I, how we can honor our desires by recognizing three truths. The first truth is this, the walk, stand, sit dilemma. You're like, what? This guy's weird. Angels and animals and human and walk, stand, sit dilemma. 
If you have a Bible, turn with me to Psalm chapter 1. I love the book of Psalms because it's, it's just, again, it's, it's prayer training. It's just honest and raw. But this is how the Psalms start. It just simply says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Real talk, I'm in seventh grade. I'm at my buddy's house. My whole life has been built around being an angel, playing basketball and soccer. We're over at my buddy's house. There's 12 guys. We're in a Madden tournament, video game tournament. It's just awesome. I'm in the finals. Drew Bledsoe's my quarterback. I lose. And, 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 and as we're playing in the beginning of the game, all the rest of the 10 dudes are watching. By the end of the game, they're gone. So I look at my buddy Andy. I'm like, hey, man, where did the guys go? He's like, I don't know. So we start walking around this house. And we're like looking. We're like, hey, guys, hey, hey. Hey, where are you? Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Can't, can't find him. Walking, 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 walking. We find ourselves going down a long hallway, and there's an office. Walk, 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 walk. I walk in this room, and there's a whole bunch of 7th, 8th grade guys around a computer. And I'm seeing something that I've never seen before in my life. Right there, I find myself standing. And I don't know. Because my whole talk has been don't do crack and don't get someone pregnant, which I don't even know how to get either or do either. <laughs> and now I'm just sitting here in this moment going, I don't, I, I don't I'm conflicted because something feels in me and something doesn't feel right about this, but something feels right about this. And all the other guys are sitting and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to sit or run. And so a seventh grade kid sits. Because I wasn't given a map. And here's what I need you to understand is that all sin, every choice that we make to live less than, is starts when we find ourselves walking, standing, and sitting. And part of the process for us, if we are actually going to honor our desires, is to recognize when we find ourselves walking away from, walking away from the presence of God, minimizing the temple. And there's a walk, stand, sit that can move us towards brokenness and animalistic tendencies, but there's also a walk, stand, sit that can be like, just deny yourself and detach from who you are. And I see that happen too. Don't have the conversations. Don't talk about it. Just pretend. Put on the shiny look and make it seem like you have it all together and don't ever talk about your desires. And we've got to be better at this. We've got to be honest. Let's go to the next one. And we can honor our desires when we recognize the power of play it out. I'll tell you what, this is, this is worth the price of admission today. This, these three words, play it out, and it was free for you to come. But like, literally, like, this for me has changed everything. Everything. And, and, and I want you to see this. James, the brother of Jesus, you, you ever feel bad for that guy? He's like, dude, really? He healed another person? <laughs> I can't even like I can't even like play Operation right, you know. Like I got like what? It's like, like what's like what? Why are you so perfect, you know? But James writes these words, and and I think they're just unbelievably powerful. This is this: When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away, just remember those two words, dragged away, by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now, this word, like dragged away, is where we get that idea and entice. Those words put together actually is where we get the idea for bait, like fishing bait. 
And a couple months ago, no, a couple years ago, I took my son out, and we decided to go fishing with my father-in-law. My father-in-law is a good fisherman. He's got a bass boat, loves to fish. I'm not so much a fisherman. I like things on a field and a court. And we're like there, and my son is just like, got another one. Hey, Dad, did you catch one? I'm like, nope. Did you catch one, Dad? No. I'm like, how many you got? He's like, four. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Okay, you're better than me at this. One thing. But, like, <laughs> I'm like, you know. Just, and so, like, he like, finally he's got seven. And I'm like, dude, come over here. Come over here. He's like, yeah. And he's standing near the edge of the boat. I'm like, man, look at that. He's like, what? And I just pushed him in the water. I said, pride comes before the fall, son. <laughs> but here's what I want you to think. When I talk about playing it out and what James is thinking about this, have you ever thought about this? You, you put, like, a worm on the end of a fishing line on the hook, and you cast it out. Just imagine this. You're out there, and then all of a sudden, this fish is like, oh, my goodness. And it's about to bite when his buddy goes, no, 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 don't do it. And he's like, why? It looks good. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Underneath that worm is a hook, and it's going to go right through your gum. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be like, ow. Ow. And you're going to try and get, and it's not. It's going to have hooked you. And then on the other end is some eight-year-old kid, and he doesn't know how to do this, and so he's just yanking it, yanking it, yanking it, yanking it, yanking it. And then he's going to pull you, and you're like losing half of your lip, majority of your teeth, and you're going to fight it, but you got nothing because you're small and you have not been to the gym for a while. And you're literally, you're literally going to get dragged in, and then they're going to pull you up. And then you know what's going to happen? There's going to be seven people on a boat who are like, oh, that's such a good job. And they're going to make you, take you off that hook, and you're going to stand there out of water. You can't breathe. And what are they doing? They're getting a picture for Instagram. <laughs> and then they're going to throw you into a cooler. And it's a bucket of ice. And you're just going to sit there. And you're going to be like, ah, oh, it feels good on my gums. But not really. And they're going to sit there, and then they're going to add a whole bunch of other fish to it. And then you know what they're going to do? They're going to drive you home. Not to your real home, but to their home. And there's going to be charcoal, and it's going to smell really, really good. And then they're going to wash you, and you're like, that feels all right. And then literally what they're going to do is they're going to take out a knife, and they're going to fillet you, and they're going to put you on that grill, and they're going to make fish tacos. <laughs> How good does that worm look? <laughs> and I say this because we've lost the art of playing it out. When you have desires... You don't have to deny them, and you do not have to say, I deserve them, and let them run wild. Great desires is literally going, okay, 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 can I play this out? And let's say I find myself walking, standing, and sitting in this, in this conversation, online, looking at this, experiencing this, walking away from these conversations with my kids, walking away from this conversation with my spouse. All of a sudden, when you start to play it out and you begin to go, hey, am I actually becoming more in tune with the temple that God made me to be? Or am I actually walking out of alignment, becoming an angel or becoming an animal? And literally, friends, I kid you not, there are so many times where I'm like, I just stop, give myself five seconds, and I go, play it out, play it out, play it out, play it out. That's not worth it. And I just play it out. And, I, and I'm not like, I'm not denying my desire. I'm just saying, at the end of the day, that's not worth the conversation I would want to have with my son or my daughter because of some decision I chose to make as an animal. Or, play it out, play it out, play it out. I don't want my son or my daughter to have to walk through this life without the tools when they are being bombarded with these messages from culture. Play it out, play it out, play it out. And how do we learn to honor that? When you understand the walk, stand, sit dilemma and you learn how to play it out, you, have un you begin to discover the importance of self-control. The importance of self-control. And this, this is the only thing that can guide us when it comes, in my opinion, to the conversation of lust. And I, and I love, I love like Proverbs 25, 28. It just simply says, 
Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. And truth be told, when it comes to a conversation like lust, anything sexual, for some of us, we've experienced profound levels of abuse or trauma. That's the reason we want to just deny and detach. Because something was broken. Something was wronged. For some of us, we were encouraged. This is what a man is. Deserve it, demand it, take it, get it. That's what a man is. And now we found ourselves and it hasn't satisfied and it hasn't delivered. And the truth is, when you begin to recognize the importance of self-control, you begin to recognize, where are there broken pieces in my foundation that are in need of being made right and whole? And, and here's, here's the truth. We all get to decide, am I going to be an animal? And we'll put up animal, angels, and humans. Am I going to be an animal, someone who desires, deserves, demand? And just think about that. Are there areas in my life or I lust for something and I go after it and I get it. And it's actually not delivering. Or there are areas in my life where I'm like an angel. I have these desires, I just deny them, I don't talk about them, I just detach from them because I feel such shame about them. And I'm just telling you, that is like a wall, like a, a brick that is out of the wall and this is the truth. The enemy will get in there and just heap more shame or heap more opportunities for temptation. But to be human? He says, I have these desires, but I also have these holes in my wall where bricks, because of my story, because of my choices, and actually, I just want to talk about them. I want to talk about them with a pastor. I want to talk about them with a mentor. I want to talk about them with my spouse. I want to talk about them with a count. I want to be honest, and I want to discuss them with God. I want to ask him to father me through this and learn to delight in the right things, the right things the right conversations. And, and I think the more that we, as women and men, can step into not being angels or, or animals, but to be human, it's an absolute game changer. I'll tell you this, last thing. Both angels and animals were created before us. And every time we decide to be one of them, we go backwards in the creation story. But the truth is, God made us to create, to bring beauty and order into this world. And so when we have the courage to step into our human, connected, attached to the vine, holy temple, filled with the Spirit of God, making decisions, we're creating a new world. A world where God and His goodness and what He delights is made known. Where are you on this journey today? And, and I know sometimes we'll, at Faith Bridge we'll do a response, but I, I just thought maybe, maybe this response, because whenever you talk about a topic like lust, again, some of the messages can be such shameful, shameful, shameful messages. I hope you don't hear that in my spirit and my tone. What I long for you is to step forward and be who God made you to be. And so here's what I'd love to do. I'm just going to invite you, and, and this is kind of something I do in my house, something that I, I tend to do when I'm leading a response time, is just invite people to open up their hands. Open up their hands. And, and you can close your eyes if you want to. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. I just have my hands open as a sense of, I just need to receive. I need to receive. And sometimes, if you're like me, I need my posture to go before my heart and my mind. But here's here's what I just want you to, to receive. is that God calls you his temple. His spirit says, I want to dwell in you. I want to dwell in you. And these are the moments right now where I feel like shame can just kick in because then we're like, oh, I just, I blow it all the time. I'm not very good at this. That's not what I want you to think about. I want you just to sit for a second is, man, maybe, maybe I've been going backwards in my story because that's what I've seen modeled. That's what I've seen celebrated around me. 
Angels celebrated. Animals celebrated. But the true vulnerability is stepping forth and say, I'm going to be a temple in my family. I'm not going to shy away from hard conversations. I'm going to discuss the stuff with my spouse or with God or my friends. And just take a moment right now and just, just really think, if, if, if really we were like a, a walled city, where are those like holes in that wall when it comes to the topic of lust? Where are those places? Maybe it's shame and angels. Maybe it's, maybe it's around lust and animals. Maybe it's in just fear of just being human. But, but just in this moment right now, in your own way, just say, Lord, Father me through this. Father me through this. I don't know how to have conversations with my son. And my simple prayer is, Lord, father me through this. Lord, father me through this. I'm on the road a lot. I got to be so, so, so careful. And I'm like, Lord, father me through this. Father me through this. Father me through this. And one of the ways that God fathers me through this is he invites me to sink deep in his grace and in his mercy. And I just want this song to wash over you. I want you just to receive the beauty and the depth of these words and allow God's spirit to remind you, you are his, bought with a price and a holy, sacred temple that he longs to dwell more and more fully in. So hear these words and may they wash over your hearts and souls.